Rowlands presenting a hierarchy of cemeteries. And this uh, notification also of a change to the timetable. Uh, Peter's talk will finish as scheduled at 11, but we then have a coffee break for half an hour, which was not on the schedule. Uh, once past more announcement, would you please check on that? If anyone hasn't paid Nicky or Anton, uh, would you please do so during the lunch times? Beginning of so, the lunch, probably. Yeah, lunch, yes. Right, over to you. So a hierarchy of cemeteries. We heard a bit about cemetery last night from Richard Feynman, and he talked about imperfect cemeteries. I think it's, um, I don't really think those cemeteries are imperfect. I think they're perfect. It's just a combination of cemeteries that makes them look imperfect. <coughs> Say more about that. <coughs> anyway, what I'm saying here is that we're not actually particularly good at cemetery. We're not very good at all. As only a few people really do it in any significant way. And they're not very good at it and they struggle. So it's obviously not easy for us. But one thing that we can do, and that we wouldn't be here now if we couldn't, is rec recognised patterns. If, if we couldn't recognise patterns in the jungle, etc., we, we wouldn't be here. And this is just as well because everywhere you see physics, there's symmetry somewhere suggesting that this is the deeper understanding will come from symmetry. And what Richard Feynman said last night about imperfect symmetries, nowadays often called broken symmetries, disguised or hidden ones. Uh, classic example, space and time. I think Anton said something about this yesterday. These are combined in relativity, but they actually refuse to be one thing, whatever Minkowski said about it. They refuse to be a single parameter. They are two different ones combined. So that's a classic broken symmetry. So which are the most fundamental, and where does any of it come from at all? And how do these symmetries help us to understand them? Also, why are some broken, and what do we mean by that? Um, and we talk about symmetries SU3, SU2, U1. We use integers to represent these symmetries. Which are the most important integers? So I'm going to propose there's a hierarchy of symmetries emerging at a very fundamental level, each of which is interlinked with all the others. And I want to show those interlinkings and why they're connected. And my philosophical starting point, as it has been for a very long while, is that the ultimate origin of symmetry in physics is zero totality. That's the whole point of it. So the sum of every single thing in the universe is precisely nothing at all. Uh, uh, another way of putting it, and this is the way I always used to put it beforehand, is that nature has no definable characteristic. It isn't discrete, it isn't continuous, it isn't anything that's definable. So I, I also think zero is the only one place you can start from. If you start from anywhere else, you have to explain it. But you don't have to explain zero because you can't. It's just not explainable. So that's, that to me is one of the most important for anything of this kind. So how do we go from zero? I can do it in a more logical way, and I have done it. And I've done it at Amper in a more logical way, but I'm not going to do it that way today because it would take the, the whole session. So I'm going to start more semi-empirically. And I'm going to say the major symmetries in physics, there's two really, there's two that matter more than any others, duality and anti-commutativity. No others matter really to the same extent. All the others are a version of that. And there's only two fundamental numbers or integers that matter, and that's two and three. Everything else comes from those alone. All the fancy groups and so on are just twos and threes, just dualities and, and anti-commutativities, that's all they are. And uh, this fits, the, the last statement there I made, it fits in with what I've said before about the universal rewrite structure, anti-commutativity is like a creation thing, and duality is like a conservation thing. And so I'm going to start now with the symmetry, which 
I've had for more than 40 years. It's not well known, but I believe it's the foundation, the one that's most foundational. And I would stake everything on this above everything else. And this is for the four fundamental parameters, space, time, mass, and charge. Uh, we've got to be careful what we mean by these. Mass has the more expansive meaning, meaning including energy. It's the source of gravity. That's the way I see it. Uh, it, it so it include, incorporates energy. And charge are the sources of all three gauge interactions. So there isn't just one charge, there are three. But they're just one thing, but there are three of them. Electric, strong and weak. And we think of those as being totally different, but that is because of symmetry breaking. Ultimately, it's an emergent property, and I want to show how it emerges, how that symmetry breaking emerges. It's not a fundamental property. This is again what I'm saying about broken symmetries. There isn't some symmetry breaking mechanism. There's symmetries coming together and looking broken. And that's the way it works. Uh, so I'm just going to say, show it's an emergent property which we can get from the algebra. And it's possible to represent these the properties of these parameters symmetric in the form of a Klein form group. A, the group of the rectangle, this is a diagram I asked Vanessa uh, to draw for me, uh, lacking, personally lacking these diagrammatic skills myself. And this shows the properties of all the four parameters and how they are perfectly symmetrical. And I've got to say I've tested that to destruction over 40 years and never found any deviation from that perfect symmetry. It is a perfect symmetry, absolutely 100%. Anything else we can show is emergent. So Klein 4 group is also called D2, dihedral 2, the uh, group of the rectangle. In German it's often called the group Fehrengruppe, the, the group of order 4. Um, and those are the properties that these uh, objects have. And they are exact properties, they are not broken in any way. And from that, from those symmetries alone, and not from any other consideration, one can explain many, many, many things in physics. And I give a list of just some of the things. It struck me that there is a, there's an opportunity for another book in this, a book that asks questions and gives the answers according to this way of thinking. So why light charges repel but masses attract? The deep frontier states, I've discussed this in some detail and it's discussed in these two books, which now I'm here. These are the two books that I've recently published, the World Scientific, Foundations of Physical Law, that's the more technical book. It's related to the lectures of mine that are on YouTube. And this is the more popular book, How Schrodinger's Cat Escaped the Box. I'll say more about them later. But this symmetry is in there, and the reason for it and the explanation for it. Um, by the way, I've got four copies of this, two of damaged copies. I'm prepared to sell those off much, cheap, much cheaper than the main cost, if people are interested in, in a damaged copy cheaply. But I've got two that are damaged, so... Hello? This, that's the simple question. Yep. The third item down... Unipolarity. Yeah, it means that you don't have positive and negative mass, you only have one or the other. Yeah. Okay, that's because it's a continuum. You look there, you see that mass is one of the continuous properties. Well, it doesn't say so there, but that dimension, dimensional means discontinuous, one dimensional is continuous. So an aspect of it. Okay, now one of the key aspects of this symmetry is that one can express it using algebra alone. So, if it's, um, I'm sorry, one of the key aspects, I've got to say that uh, space is a three dimensional quantity, but it's, and by the way, you can only have three dimensions if you've got dimensions, there aren't any other, uh, in, the, in, the, in this sense. So it's not just an ordinary vector, it's one, one with the cliff, properties of a Clifford algebra. This is a Clifford algebra. You have vectors. Then you have imaginary vectors, which are called bivectors, pseudo vectors, or quaternions, depending on uh, how you derive them. And you, you have imaginary numbers, which are also called trivectors, complex numbers, or pseudo scalars. And you have scalars. And the full algebra requires all of this. And of course, area is, is bivector, volume is, tr is trivector. Uh, it's, it's completely standard, uh, well established. 
if you, you've got to realise that the, the three dimensionality of space is in fact more than more than it used to be thought. It's not just a vector, it's one of these sort of vectors, which is why we have spin. The space time and, and charge mass groupings then become exact mirror images. We've got three real for space, one imaginary for time, three imaginary for, for charge, and one real for mass. It's what Heston has called multivariate vectors. These are isomorphic to power matrices and complexified quaternions, and they have a full product. It's not just a vector and a scale product, it's a full product. And when you take the full product, you, you realise that that's what brings in the concept of spin. It, it automatically brings in the concept of spin from the second turn in the full product. Estimates, for example, show if we use del del psi, a multivariate vector psi, instead of the scalar product in the Schrodinger equation, we could in fact derive a spin half an electron from that equation. We didn't need relativity to do it. It doesn't have anything to do with relativity, in fact. So space and time are a kind of four vector with three real parts and one imaginary. And that happens because it's symmetric to the mass and charge quaternion. Now, uh, Anton had something about uh, imaginary charge. This is three imaginary charges of quaternion charge. So it's related to that idea, but it's quaternion charge. And this is a very old idea in this work, and it, 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 it will show how this ceases to be perfectly symmetric. It's an emergent property. Vectors like quaternions are also anti-commutative, of course. And that you can represent the group properties just using another method of using algebra is just to use x and minus x for property and anti-property. And so you can see there's a totality of zero conceptually if we do it that way. Now these are arbitrary. I could switch the x's and y's around, or I could switch the pluses and minuses around. But that's just an arbitrary way of doing it. So I'm switching now the first the x's around, but not the the anything else. If I switch the x's around and leave the y's and z's, switch the minuses and plus on the x's, it, we create a dual version of the group, a group which reverses one of the properties, anti-properties. And here I've reversed the first property. You only need to reverse one and then you get this dual group. We will show them there is a meaning for that, and we'll show it what it is later. If I put the two groups together, that one and that one, I can then show that the, the, uh, the whole table uh, has a structure, a group of order 8. It's C2 times D2. D2 is each group, and C2 is combining them. And so I guess <coughs> that as a group structure, and you may recognize that as being the same as the quaternion multiplication table. So if I put the two groups together, I get quaternion multiplication table. Now, we know the meaning of the first group, we've not established the meaning of the second, we'll come to that later. And as I've said already, the symmetry may be assumed to be completely exact. I've never found an exception to it in 40 years. Occasionally, something came up that looked as though it might be, and then suddenly you realize you found a new aspect of it a new aspect emerges, and that's always a very good sign. If, when, when you appear to have an anomaly, then it leads to a discovery, you know, that's a good sign. And as you, once we've got this condition, we can then put constraints on physics to derive laws and states of matter. I have done that in the past, I've done that in, in some of my books and papers, I'm not going to do it today. We can also um, have some nice representations, you know, which I'll show you in a minute, that the those, but I'm not up to them yet. Now, if we've got a perfect symmetry between all four parameters, people say, well, why do we have time? Why do we have mass? Why do we have these things? The reason we need symmetry. If we got one of them, then we must have the other three if we got the symmetry. We don't have to explain it any more than that. that that's the end of explanation. We don't have to sort well, what's all this time about? I know exactly what time is about. It's got this place in the symmetry, and that tells you what its exact properties are. And we don't have to worry about it. We do know that, as Anton was talking about, space is the only thing that can be used for measurement. 
So the other parameters don't have the capacity that they can be measured directly. So once we got one, the others come out like kaleidoscopic images. They're there automatically. So it's in principle arbitrary which we would we start with. We don't have to start from space. That's the one we naturally start from because it's the only measurable one. But we could start from one of the others. And, and because these are three-dimensional images, or three component images in some way, it shows the, uh, the fundamental three-dimensionality is so important to this concept. It's very, very foundational physics. This, this color representation, now if you take one of, each of, one of each of these as the three main properties, the primary colors, then the, then the anti-property to that will be the secondary colour. So if that is real, that, that is imaginary. Okay? And so we could, we could, each circle here would be one of the four parameters. And you can see the perfect symmetry between them. Or we could reverse it. We could, this could be the dual group, for example. And there we start with the secondary colours and move out towards the, the primary ones as reverses of the secondary. We add them up, we get nothing. We get white. Uh, this, this actually is much better without the, the lines like that. This shows both the group and the dual, dual group. If we do take the x, y, and z seriously, the plus and minus, we can start from the center point, and each of the red lines will represent a, uh, one of the parameter group, one of the four parameters. And each of the cyan lines will represent one of these dual parameters. Then we can have a tetrahedral representation, we can do either faces, or we can do uh, the, the edges of the properties and the faces, or the vertices, are the members of the group or the dual group. And so if you get three things going into a vertex, you know that it's one of the, one of the group. So the striking thing about the parameters is that they're purely abstract. We don't need any more information, just abstraction. We, they're just pure algebra. Real and imaginary, commutative and anti-commutative are obviously just algebra. Conserved and non-conserved are also just algebra. You can show it's just algebra. There's a, it's connected with the extra I term. And they each have their own algebra, which serve to define them. And the physical properties are just a representation of that algebra. Physics becomes just mathematics. Just abstraction. So we start with Mass, which is a scalar, time, which is a pseudo scalar, charge, which is a return, and space, which is a vector. And this is another symmetry that comes into it. So we see how all these symmetries build up onto each other. Charge, time, and mass put together. Once I showed you the Clifford algebra, you, you may be able to see that those three put together are equivalent to a pure Clifford algebra of three dimensional space, a pure vector algebra. But it's not the vector algebra space, it's another one. So we have two vector algebras. The whole structure is two vector algebras. That's one representation. So if, if we multiply this charge quaternions by i, we will get these. So we can see that those three put together and that one uh, a kind of e e equal um, amount of information. Space appears to have a privileged state, status because it's more complicated and complex than the others. Now I'm just going to do the Clifford algebra of three-dimensional space. So this is its three subalgebras, bivector, trivector, and, and scalar, and those are the components of those algebras. And if we put them all together we get a kind of alternative space. So if I combine the whole structure together I get this. This is what I was saying before. And I propose to call that vacuum space, and the reason will become apparent later. So we've got another symmetry here. We've got the symmetry between space and everything else. So everything else is like a space, and I've also called it anti-space, because it, the whole totality adds up to zero. So the two spaces cancel. And we remember that we define particles in physics to be points. Um, as far as we know, 
the electron has no size. And you can't get a point in space. You cannot get a point in space. Space will not give you a point because space is rotation and translation uh, symmetrics. You cannot actually say, I want a point in space. It's nonsense. But you can create a point if you've got two spaces, which cancel each other at that very point. You can imagine it's a kind of outflow into the other one, or outflowing into the, the first one. And this is precisely what happens, and we call it to the vacuum. So oh, the, 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 the cancelling of the two space and anti space. Yeah. It's something which gives origin to something which is self referential. Yeah. Oh, yes, exactly. The, the, that's the, the point particle. That's what it means. That's what it means. So there's no such thing as a point in space. Mm. It's, 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 it's nonsense in itself. In physical space, you can't have a point, but you can have a point between two spaces, and it is self-referential. And we know that the algebras of charge, time, and mass are subalgebras of vector algebra. So, though all the parameters are equivalent in the group structure, they also produce a mathematical hierarchy. And there's also an evolutionary aspect to this, and this is the rewrite structure I would need to do to explain that. But it's explained in the, in the black book. And it's been explained in earlier rounders. As I say, you can in fact derive the evolution. It's a much more fundamental information process. And uh, I've been studying this process with, uh, on, on my own and with Peter Mars and with Vanessa Hill. And we, we find it operating in mathematics, computer science, chemistry and biology, as well as in comp more complex aspects of physics than this. So if we package that information, now that, let's suppose that's all the information we have, and that's what we call physics. And how do we package it? We got working out every possible combination <laughs> to package that algebra means working out every possible combination of it. And it's, this turns out to be exactly the algebra we want, because it's the algebra of the Dirac equation, the, the equation for the point fermionic particle. The only structure that we know truly exists. <coughs> yeah. Are there any aspects of this algebra which haven't been properly investigated yet? Um, I don't think the, the full aspects of its use have been fully investigated at all in quantum mechanics. Right. Not at all. Um, there's huge amounts still to be found in our laboratory. The algebra itself we know well, but we don't know the, you know, what it can lead to. Okay. I think there's a lot more to be done on that. So there are 64 possible products, and you can see if you, if you multiply all these things out, you get that, those 64 products. It tells you how those 64 work out. And that tells you what they look like. That's plus and minus versions of those. And they're also a group. So we're onto another group now. We're onto another group, and this is the key thing, because this group, now any group can be derived from generators. We don't need the whole of the group to derive it. We don't need, uh, there, there's always a minimal number of generators which will, uh, members of the group which will derive the rest. And you see the asterisk terms there, those five alone will generate the whole group. If you multiply all those out many times, we will eventually get the whole group. So they're generators, but they're not the only ones, they're not unique. I could have chosen lots of other fives, as I will show you later. But the simplest starting point is five. And this is the, the, the set of elements which, which you need to generate the whole group. Uh, you've got 64. There's that 32 up there because it's plus and minus of those. Okay. Uh, usually people call the Dirac algebra the 16-part algebra. It is a 16-part algebra in one sense because they don't take plus and minus and plus and minus i and i and one and i the, 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 the core part of it is 16 but, but you've got plus and minus of it and you've got one and i aren't it? so I think that's what they mean yeah. there are 64 in total so and another thing here 
we can, we can do it slightly differently. There I combined vectors and quaternions, because that's what I use physically, but I could have done double vectors complexified. Complexified double vectors, that's complex number there, the black eye. But the other terms, red and blue, are the two quaternion sets. Again, it's plus and minus of all those. Or I could have done it as double vectors. Again, we need complexification, but we have double vectors there. Like there's in our two spaces. So we can do it in three, at least, at least three different ways. And there are many other representations. I think I've already you know, said that. Now we started with eight units. By the time we've worked out all the possible combinations, we find that there's 32 or 64. We need five generators, and, and there are many ways of selecting these, but all such pentad sets have the same overall structure. There is a way of doing it with five, using two vectors and two vectors and co complex numbers. But, that's, but, but that doesn't uh, preserve either of the vector sets. It doesn't preserve the properties that we need for space, which is to have the whole vector set preserved. And it's always five. So instead of having the eight primitives, we have five composites, as it were. And this is, this is laying out the whole 64 in sets of five. Each of these is a set of five. You see, each of these rows is a set of five. Each of those is a set of five. And apart from the four complex numbers, we have 12 sets of five. And any of them could be used to generate the algebra. But you can see they all have the same structure. You see, they all have the same structure. It's either red or blue, vectors or quaternions, but, but it's all the same structure. And the structure shows, crucially, that one of the symmetries is preserved and the other is broken. But you see the I, J, K on this one, the blue ones? That's preserved because it's multiplied by the same object with the red K. But if you look at the red ones, the red K, J and I is not preserved because they're each multiplied by something else. So this is this what Richard Feynman called imperfect symmetry. But it isn't imperfect, it's absolutely perfect. It just looks imperfect from this viewpoint because you're combining two different symmetries together. And that's why it looks imperfect. But from this point of view, the blue three-dimensionality is preserved, perfect, but the red one is not. And that's, that's a crucial thing. And that's because 5 is always a symmetry breaker. So this is one way of doing it. We take the 8, and then we take the 3 red ones and place them under the 5 others. And then we get our combined units. This is about halfway. Sorry? This is about halfway. Oh, right, yes. I have no idea what that in, in the presentation. So, I've shown how you have to break the symmetry of one or the other. And in fact, this creates new parameters that we didn't have before. These are new compound and quantized because the thing that we, we stuck on them was charge, which is a quantized unit to start with. We create new concepts, quantized energy, momentum and rest mass. We didn't have them before. We only had space and time, mass and charge. But now we've got these by this combination. And though these are just scalar values I'm putting at the bottom just to I indicate what they are. Now if we stick all of that together, bundle all that together, then we find the thing that we've created physically is an object which squares to zero. So if I bundle everything together, multiply it by itself, I get nothing. And this is always our end point, we always want to get to zero. We get Einstein's relative physic energy equation. And the Dirac equation simply quantizes this structure here. Simply uses the standard quantization procedure. And what that quantization procedure is really is applying non-conservation to a conserved quantity. So you're replacing a conserved quantity by a non-conserved quantity. And that's all it really amounts to. Which we can do. We can swap one for the other. So that's what we're doing there. We, we're replacing these things here by non-conserved quantities. 
And non-conserved quantities don't exist as quantities. I haven't had time to deal with this. They're just differentials which act on something, which is a variable. And so this is how we get our Dirac equation. But notice, when we reduce final potency from 8, we have another symmetry breaking. We, leave, leave, we lose a degree of freedom because there are, no, there are four side variations in E and P, but there's no side variation in M. So we, we sacri when we get a nil potent structure like that, like the top one up there, and we know that we've got plus and minus there, plus and minus there, plus and minus there, plus and minus there, but it's meaningless to have another plus and minus. So we lose a degree of freedom when we do it. And that ultimately leads to chirality. If we write out the four components of the pluses and minuses, I didn't go into the detail about plus and minus, but there are pluses and minuses. We get those options. Now, these are arbitrary, but it's convenient to, uh, to adopt those. Now, um, the spin of profits that algebra still hold, even when we don't use a matrix uh, representation, that's the traditional way of doing it. So, psi is a four component spinner, including four things. We, we don't need psi, but we can, we can use it for, for, uh, just to identify these things. Okay, I'm not going to deal with that. We can use the, 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 the bracket for either oper operator or amplitude. So this, this object here is, it incorporates relativity and quantum mechanics in a more powerful version than, than the conventional version. In, the, in quantum mechanics, we take the first bracket as an operator acting on a phase factor because we've chosen the non-conserved option, not the conserved option. The E and P term can include any number of potentials. Squaring to zero gives us power of exclusion because any two, if any two particles are the same, when we combine them, we get nothing. So I'm saying in this version of quantum mechanics, we don't have an equation at all. We don't even have the Dirac equation. We don't have any equation. We just have an operator. We have an operator acting on a phase factor squared equals amplitude squared equals zero. And I've shown how that can solve many problems simply and more powerfully than by any other method. Now I want to look at another aspect of the breaking of the symmetry. <coughs> Before I looked at the breaking of, of the symmetry, of, of the creation of energy, momentum and mass. But if we look at the red objects now, we see that we have another broken symmetry, the one between the weak, strong and electric charges. And we notice that the weak charge has got this complex I in it, the strong charge has got a vector term and the electric charge is a scalar term. Ultimately, and it, I, I've shown this, it's in the blackboard, the, these objects, the, the, this breaking leads to this, this, these symmetries, these lead group symmetries come from those algebraic representations. And we can demonstrate that completely 100% rigorously. And it's done in that blackboard. So the meaning of the dual group also becomes clear. We didn't know what that meant when we created it. So we, what we've done is attach quaternion operators to time, space, and mass terms. So we've effectively changed real and imaginary terms. So if we stick a quaternion operator in front, that object, total object, then becomes a thing with changed uh, nature. The imaginary becomes real, real becomes imaginary. And so that's what we do with the dual group. And the fourth term is provided by the spin angle momentum, which provides the same structure as overall charge. So the first group, the, the main group, is the ontology of physics. The second is the means by which we observe it. And the two groups together give us the quantized space space of the fermion. However, in quantum mechanics, the two groups aren't independent because one is created from the other. That means they're not independent, which means they're not completely commuted. to. And so, Ultimately, this is where we get our exclusion principle from. The parameter group in its dual form cancel, but not to zero, but to h. So this is a different aspect of the symmetry. I'm saying there's also, we can also do an octonian mapping. I'll show you the octonian mapping. If I do that, then that's got the structure of an octonian. However, everything that's non-physical in, in the octonian becomes those things that are anti-associative. So the problems you have at octonians 
turn out to be non-physical objects. And yet another symmetry built into all this structure, if we take double quaternions, the, the red and the blue, and we, we just take the paired terms, we get another algebra called the H4 algebra. And this H4 algebra also has a Klein 4 relationship. We can also do it using minus double vectors. And that's an H4 algebra. And that's the same, that's the same structure as the Klein 4 group for the parameters. It's another Klein 4 group. And this shows us that ultimately the two three-dimensionalities don't have a broken symmetry at the ultimate level. At the most fundamental level of the spinner structure, they don't. They are perfect. Because the, the red and the blue always go together, that's a perfect matching. At this level, they don't break. So, so behind all this brokenness is a true symmetry. I can show that these lead to, to a spinner structure. That's a spinner structure. I'm not going to go into details on that. That's how you do it. Uh, and it Anybody who's interested can see that the spinner structure can be made up of the projection operators we use with the Dirac equation to get the left and right handed parts. If you get two sets of those projection operators, then you get the four spinner. So if, if I combine two sets, I'll get the four spinner. Um, and what I'm saying here is the result shows the fundamental difference between symmetries based on the number two and those based on the number three. And all the uniqueness in nature comes from a competition, as it were, between these two. The Weyl equation, which uh, the Dirac equation of massless particles, uh, it's recently has, has been claimed to the condensed matter pseudo particles that claim to be Weyl particles, effectively half the wave functioning, something that Lou's interested in here, this one, um, eliminating the right handed fermion, left handed fermion. This is a university machine, nothing to do with it. I haven't done that. It's the university. <laughs> I asked them to give me a machine and they gave me this one. Geometrically, the two, two components, Pauli spinner, can be represented by a Mebius band. So that's a standard representation, but you get the twist in it. And, but a four component, Dirac spinner can be represented by a Klein model, which is two media spans. I've just shown how to construct it from two. That's going on here, is this nonsense? No, no. It's all right. No, no, it's just, it's, I don't know, I don't know what, what they're doing, but, but we've got a license, we've got a license for any number of those, so it's nonsense. <laughs> so, the chirality is introduced by making the massless fermion one-handed, even with a two-spinner structure. I'm saying the chirality is yet another broken symmetry because once you introduce a mass term, you introduce a degree of the other-handedness. And this is the other-handedness is the switching between the two, two spaces. Uh, I've, I've ju just done this deliberately. I had a competition with a colleague that I could introduce the word Widdershims into a, into a paper. <laughs> <laughs> so I so said the structure of the Dirac equation makes the carats left handed as opposed to the right handed carats of human beings. And isn't it amazing? My eye fell on that and that's the word that they hit. <laughs> and so that's, um, we know that we're chiral because we use words like sinister for left handed and we also use words like Widdershims, they're all the wrong way around to go anti clockwise. So there we are. I've now introduced it. <laughs> we got another symmetry if we look at power exclusion. Is it, is it against the sun, Widder Schins? Because Widder, Widder in German is, is against. There, there is a similar word in old German as well as old yeah, English. It sounds like it's against the way the sun goes or something. Yeah. It, it could be. Yeah. Could be. <laughs> Anton might be able to tell us. <laughs> So another way of looking at power exclusion, at least another symmetry, we can say we've got totality of zero, so you plot the particle out of absolute nothingness, whatever, in all its special state, and you're left with a hole in that nothingness, which you call vacuum. And that hole in that nothingness 
happens to be the rest of the universe that is needed for the particle to be in the state it's in. And so, if we do that, then the rest of the universe will look like that. And so, we can add it up to nothing, or we can multiply it to nothing, which are the two things that we need to do. So the fermion constructs its own vacuum on the entire universe in which it operates. So the vacuum is localized, and the sorry, the vacuum is delocalized, and the, and the fermion is localized. So it's uniquely self-dual with this, and the phase is the mechanism through which this is accomplished. We could also say power exclusion means no two fermions can share the same vacuum. So we can think of the dual spaces, IJK blue and IJK red, as combining together to produce zero totality in a point particle, as I mentioned earlier. <coughs> with zero size, zero norm, Pythagorean addition to zero. And this is the only way we can produce discrete points in space. This is what I've already mentioned. Here's another little thing here, boundary of a boundary. This is a well-known one in mathematics. Uh, it's, we can do it in a more abstract way. We can set boundaries themselves, have vanishing boundaries, so the boundary of a set is zero. That de uh, d term is, is the boundary. So d, d squared equals zero. And for A, it's the subspace of the entire space X, and the boundary dA is the section of closures of A and the complement of A or X minus A, the closure being the unit of the set of its boundaries. So here the universe is X, the Fermi A, the rest of the universe X minus A, and then the point Fermi is itself a boundary, and the boundary of the boundary is zero. And that's nil potency. Now if you look at these, we find that 2 have plus e and 2 minus e. And if we did it in terms of time, d by dt, 2 would have plus t and 2 minus t. So what are these with minus e? These are in the vacuum space, the red one. There are as many antifermins as fermions. It's not that there are any more fermions than antifermins, that's not true. You, you can't write the Dirac equation without writing down all four. So there are as many of each. Just that we're in two different spaces. But the chirality we've built into the structure means that only those in real space are observable. So, this brings us to uh, many new ideas. I'm, I'm a big fan of the one theory, fermion theory of the universe, which is a modification of the one electron theory. And you can represent the whole of the universe by a fermion and endless succession of backward and forward time states. The entire forward history of the universe is contained in that one fermion's vacuum. But of course you can't access it, because you can only access the fermion. But the entire history is there. But it's not deterministic, because you can never define that fermion. So it's, it's, it stops it being deterministic. And you can also compare the one fermion theory with the computer program. You've got one fermion in many different states using the symbol one in many different states, a computer program uses a symbol one in many different states. So it's a very similar way of looking at things. Can you just read that last paragraph from the previous slide? Yeah, you've got, if in a computer program you've got one in many different states. So you've got one symbol in many different states, and, and it's like in the, in, the, in the universe you consider one fermion in many different states. And so, I think the idea of, of negative energy is essentially uh, that of vacuum, li links it with gravity, which produces negative energy between identical masses, uh, whereas you get positive energy between identical charges. So gravitational energy is a kind of cancellation of the energies of the three gauge interactions. That's an old idea of mine, and nowadays the string theorists have taken that up and called it gravity gauge theory correspondence, thinking they're the originators, but they aren't. Um, there's a further link via the Dirac field vacuum, the Higgs field, through the weak interaction. Uh, now, because of the complex nature of this thing here, IKE, the weak charge effectively is a dipole with the vacuum. And you can <coughs> carry that through to show how it leads to a harmonic oscillator solution and the properties of the weak interaction. Uh, dipoles, unlike monopoles, are attractive, and so they create negative energy. That's an interesting way of looking at it. 
And I've always liked this idea. Again, computer mathematics, you've got string of 1s to infinity is minus 1, because when you add 1 to it, you get a string of 0s to infinity. And so that symbol parallels vacuum being minus e or minus t. And so that brings in the one idea again for the fermion. So it ref reflects the built-in bias for Fermi to be local and the anti-Fermi to be local at non -local, even though they're equal numbers. But can we have anti fermions that are local? Well, of course we can. But positive emission tomography tells us we can. We can have local anti fermions So how do we get those? Well, I think that we've got to look to the fact that there's, this is one of these places where the symmetries combine to be something that Feynman would call imperfect. There, there are ways of apparently reversing time and making negative energy positive, which relate to the fact that real space and vacuum uh, space are totally dual, but neither of these is total with dual with energy momentum space. Let me just put it like this. Real space and vacuum, the charge space, are dual, but when we combine them with momentum space, the dual, duality is only good to the uncertainty principle. It's not good. It is not because they're not commutative. So real or local antiferms are a measure of how much this uncertainty affects the duality of these objects. And there are possible ways of determining how many real local antiferms you can have. We, we should look at CP violation, the creation of neutrino masses. Now, if we had pure charge considerations, there wouldn't be any neutrino mass. On the other hand, Fermions can't exist without mass, one can show that. So, so there must be some mass, and I've previously calculated it in another lecture. And if you look at the ratio of the neutrino mass to the electron weak energy scale, it's about 10 to the minus 12. And you get a similar proportion in CP equals T violation. So that's an interesting possibility there, that we could actually calculate it. That's, I'm, I'm not going to spend long over that. That's how to do CPC symmetry. That's how to do, but what I'm interested in is that these things partition the vacuum. K, I, and J partition the <coughs> continuous vacuum of gravity into three uh, gauge vacuum. So if we identify these as vacuum operators, and the object is vacuum reflections, and it faces suggests a new meaning into the insight of the Ford Dirac force burn. So we've got the, the basic object, and then we've got four, three vacuum reflections. So they're the things in the, into which it could conceivably transform. So these things have many roles. They're charges, CPT, transformation of vacuum projections, Indicators of fermions, antifermion, and all that kind of thing with the right spinner. They're the dimensions of vacuum space dual to real space. And essentially, the fermion has a half integral <coughs> spin because it requires us to split the universe into two halves, one of which is the fermion and the other one of which is vacuum, which are mirror images of each other. And Zizibur Vagum is an obvious manifestation of the duality in and out. In and, out. and it, it privileges, in, in observational terms, it privileges rest mass. I like cat pictures. This, is, this has got many connotations. The cat, of course, doesn't, doesn't know that that's a real cat. Uh, not a real cat. It thinks it's a real cat, but it's, it's a virtual cat. It's an image. And when you think about it, mirror images are, in fact, exactly that, the vacuum images. It is the vacuum. Uh, in, a, in, a, in a reflection, you, what you're doing is specifying the mirror to be a thing which can separate out the virtual part, which is connected with the electromagnetic interaction, one of the three gauge interactions, from the real part in real space. So it, it, it's so contrived that it can eliminate everything else. Um, you see, we think of the, the mirror as reflecting that cat, but it isn't the mirror that reflects that cat, it's the whole of the universe that does it. it everything contributes. As it happens, the mirror is constructed so that most of the other things cancel. But everything con con contributes. So in fact, that is truly a vacuum image of that cat. But the 
cat doesn't know that it is. <laughs> so I'm saying that the double three-dimensionality is very apparent in biology that as the work done with Vanessa testifies, work done with Peter suggests that it, it's all self-governing systems have got the same structure. And we trace this pattern all the way through, and all the way through lots and lots of things, and I'm going to show you in the last bit one or two of those things. Uh, we get multiples of two occur over and over again in these structures, and when there's a five, it's a broken symmetry. Groups like EA, they sound very complicated, but they're not. They're, 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 they're not really anything more than a lot of twos and threes put together. The E6, E7, E8, all that kind of thing. Yeah, I'm, I'm ready. So that's one thing you can do. That's a way of using our algebra to construct particles. That's, that's the same, same pattern, same structure. Here's another thing you can do. Let me show you this one. This is, this looks complicated, but it's really simple. This is building up to 240. You remember what Garrett Leasy did with his um, use of E8 group. This is the E8 group that requires 240 um, root vectors. And effectively, you've got dualities here. You've got duality due to spin up, spin down, duality due to isospin, Duality due to Fermi anti duality due to Fermi vacuum, those are all just factors of two. And then you've got these, these factors of three due to anti commutativity, which gives the generations. And that's CPT, basically. So you can build up, and if you look through that table, you'll find everything that matters in all, the, in all kinds of things, like kissing numbers, like um, platonic solids, Archimedean solids. All that kind of stuff. They all have the same numbers in. Doesn't matter how many dimensions they've got the same numbers in. You, you, you look at DNA, you look at uh, particles, they all have those numbers and they're all made out of twos and threes. I'll just not, not do the detail on that. This was, some, this was just an appendix I had to, uh, to uh, revise, to give it a possible revision of. Covering constants, but I'll, I'll leave it at that so there's time for a few questions. How do you get a number? How do I get a number from the universal rewrite structure, chapter 10 of this book? I'm interested in certain numbers like the anomalous magnetic mind and the muon. How do you get those? Yeah. When you say a number. Ah, the anomalous magnetic moment of the muon. The, the two. Well, that's an easy one. That's it's the same two as everywhere. That's the same duality. It's different than the electron, right? It's five. Oh, you mean the slightly five. different value for the muon for the electron? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Standard model is wrong, right? Five sigma out. It's not five sigma out yet. It's only three sigma or three and a half. My, my colleagues are working on that, but they've not actually established it. Yeah. <laughs> Our guys are doing uh, lattice gauge theory on yeah. big computers. It's fine. I, I have a theory about it, but it's <coughs> I have a hypothesis about it. Oh. I, I think we, we actually looking at the electron, the, the lepton neutrino sector, slightly wrongly. If we take the quark sector, we use the CKM matrix, mm -hmm. and it's arbitrary whether we choose to use UD. UCT or DSB as the basis. If you look at the neutrino lepton sector, it's automatically assumed that the neutrinos are the things that have got variation and the leptons haven't. If you restructure it so the leptons have variation, then you can get an anomaly in the, in the muon. And I'm just wondering whether we should be thinking in those terms. We, we, we have a, an asymmetry, as it were, between two sectors with for no obvious reason. Because both sectors, we're only talking about the weak interaction, and that should be the same for both sectors. And I've never understood why you can switch between one set of quarks and another, but you can't switch between one set of leptons and another. And I just wondered if we could do that, and if that would make a difference. When you go to get a number, do you do the sweeping under the rug? You know no, I always, I always try to point out openly if there's a problem with a number. I say, well, this is the best I can do, yeah. or you know, it doesn't appear to be exact. 
So, you know, what, what is the number? Do you renormalize at some point when you're going to get a number? Do you do renormalization? No. No, I just go straight for a number. I've got, I've got some numbers. Um, I got some numbers before they were found. For example, the dark energy. I got to be two thirds, and now it's sixty-eight percent. So I'm getting there with that one. Um, and I've got other numbers, but but I sometimes say, well, this is a possible way of getting a number, but I'm not sure I believe it. Have a look at it. See if you think. Uh, I, I very. That's the last thing I ever claim is to to have perfect numbers, because that's the most difficult thing to get. I've got quite a lot of approximate ones, but I don't claim they're much more than that. What's wrong with the copy of the book here? Uh, it's, it's some of them got a bit damaged by water damage. But if you want to damage... Still readable? It, oh, yeah, it's perfectly readable. It's just not as nice to look at. I'd go for one. you go for one? Yeah. Okay, anybody else want the other damage one? I would go. Well, three or four. I've got two. <laughs> I've, got two I've got two good ones and I've got two damaged ones. How much of the good ones? Well, for you, <laughs> I had to buy some of these in order that I could get the coloured text. So to get my money back, I've got to sell for about £22. But I'll sell the damaged ones for half price. £11? Yeah. Okay, for a good one. Who, who, who's, who's the, who's the per people who, who can Bert. least afford? Richard, I would imagine, is one. Yeah. Take the yeah, you'll take damaged goods. The damaged ones are in that bag. You can see two damaged ones in there. They got damaged yesterday, actually, by the water. They got seeped into the bag. These are okay. This one I can't sell because it's my only copy. But you can have a look at it to see if you want to get it from the... It's, it's only about 20-something from the publisher anyway. It's not, not much different. See, these are damaged. It's just not perfect. Who's having the other damaged one? You see, it's a bit damaged. It smells like urine. No, no, no. It's not. <laughs> <laughs> You're the other one. Are you okay? I can, I can, but no, I can. It, which one? Who's the richer of the two? Yes, he's the richer. 22. Who wants the other ones then? I'll have a look. I'll have a look. Ronan and Paul. Going, going, gone. That's so it. <laughs> can I have one out so people can look at them? Yeah. You can show one of the damaged ones there. Yeah, they yeah. can look at them. Sure. Yeah. Sure. 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 Any more questions? I've got one. If, yeah, okay. Um, yeah. Is there any place in your in, in the algebra yeah. here for Anton's uh, new class of numbers that he was describing? Yesterday? You mean the um, you mean the well, the, I don't think you get the third axis, answers. the third axis he had. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure what that means, but. Um, because there is place for a third and fourth axes, hmm. uh, three imaginary axes, there's certainly place for that. Now, right. what they may mean is another issue. Yeah. Um, so there is place for extra axes. Right. Okay. And people can actually also, and I'll repeat this, if they look up. YouTube, Foundations of Physical Law, and put my name in, you will get the, the set of ten lectures on which this book was based, which are the more technical ones. So a good thing to do would be to read the the the, uh, the popular book first, which is not a gimme, it's not a gimme, it does actually go into some uh, detail on something, but it doesn't assume prior knowledge of physics and mathematics. It assumes that you, you don't really know any physics, but what you get way beyond the beginner's stage about halfway through. So it does actually go way beyond the beginner's stage, but it doesn't assume prior knowledge. I wanted to try to, to create a book which the intelligent person could read and understand without having to have all this extra knowledge. Oh, here you go, <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I think it's very good for physicists to read as well, students. It's very good for them. It's very good for everyone to, to read. In my opinion, you might think it's crap, but that was what the aim was. I wanted to see if I could do such a book. And I think that, that has worked reasonably well. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. well I'll give you my Yes, no worry. Okay. Um, right. Uh, did you want to just... Should we say thank you again? Oh, yeah, yes, thank you.
Yeah, if I could just have